Thank you. Thank you very much for that generous introduction. I might say that this year of the 30 years I was in the, the Navy was the only year I had any opportunity, if you want to look at it that way, to fire a weapon of any sort. I don't own one. I never fired one before. I, you can't hear. Sorry. Uh, I'm saying that before I spent this year in Vietnam, I had never fired a weapon before. I don't have a weapon now. And it was solely my experience there. I never dreamed that uh, I would be in a position where I had to do some things over there that I, I didn't uh, like doing. And, and it was actually the, the theme of my thought was going to be a negative one. But the, the more I, I thought about it, that I would try to keep this as positive as I can and try not to show you my prejudice in there. But I went from a kind of a gung-ho gun guy that thought, hey, this Vietnam War is not a good war, but it's the only one we have. So we looked at it that way, and as an opportunity to go out and do strange things. Now I'm a real peacenik. I've never seen anything good come out of a war and, uh, in my lifetime, and so I'm completely on the other side. But before, before I, I give you some of my experiences, I thought I might tell you a little something. Can, can you hear me now back there, or do I need to get real close? <laughs> OK, I, I thought I would tell you a little bit about the plane that I flew over Vietnam, the HU-1 Bravo uh, Huey. It was a great plane. It was, it was uh, by the way, this is me in the front and my 10 pilots. Actually, there's only nine there. We were supposed to have uh, 10, and I have to tell you what happened to the 10th one. was my co-pilot, and he was killed. But I'll give you that story later on. But there's uh, the Hilo. We had two of those that we had in my detachment, and those young men behind me were the ones that were with me. But uh, the Huey itself is powered by a single engine jet engine. It carries 14 rockets, uh, seven uh, in uh, a pod right behind uh, where we're, we're standing there, one on each side. It carries 5,000 rounds of ammunition fired by six machine guns. Two on each side of the front were called, uh, 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 they swiveled, and uh, they were handled by a co pilot on a, a pistol grip that he had. He could fire all four of those at one time. Of course, we had two gunners that were, we put in gunner's belts, and they hung in out the side firing M60 machine guns. Really brave, courageous young men. I, while I was OMC officer in charge of this detachment, uh, we had seven of these detachments in the de Delta that the Navy owned, and we had them over there to provide help for the SEALs, that we had a company of SEALs where I was. We had riverboat patrols going up and down the rivers trying to keep the rivers open because 95% of all the supplies that supplied the Vietnam War came up the rivers. So you can imagine how important it was to keep those rivers open. So that was part of our job. And then to protect various villages that were in my area, which was called the Runset Special Zone. But while I was there, we flew my detachment, uh, my two aircraft and my 10 pilots, flew over, let's see, we flew over 2,000 combat missions, if you can imagine. Many of them where they received uh, heavy fire. Uh, many times the planes were filled with bullets. But can you imagine how many times we ever had to come back and walk in those 2,000 uh, flights that we had? I flew 400 of them myself, so I know zero. All those 2,000 flights, every time those two planes came back to the base. Even though we had people wounded and killed, we still brought it back to the base. So it's a great, great airplane. And it's still around today. You can see them flying around Camp Pendleton there. Just a wonderful aircraft. <clears throat> I, I, I thought I would get the, the worst story. I, I, I don't know it's the worst story. It's the worst story for me out of the way uh, so I can concentrate on uh, the positive. It's my granddaughter here that just came in and her fiance. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, this is a, this is a story that I, I tried to forget the whole time I, I, I've been away from there, and, and, uh, and you'll see why it was so hard to forget. We flew in pairs uh, all the time. We always had two planes. They were called a light fire team. Occasionally, we'd have three helicopters. They were called a heavy fire team. But there was a fire team leader, 
and then a, a, a pilot that was in charge of the other ship. At this time that I had this mission, I was not the fire team leader. I'd only been in Vietnam for about a couple of weeks, and I was still trying to learn, learn my job. So there was another young man named Dick Stanger, and you'll hear his all through the time I was there. A real great pilot. It was his first tour, a JG from Florida somewhere. He was as good as they get, and if you ever have to go to war, you'd want him on your side. But he was the fire team leader. We were flying around one Sunday afternoon, beautiful day. I'd never been in any combat of any sort before. And I heard this fact plane. A fact plane was a forward air control plane. It was usually a, a Piper Cub or a small Cessna, uh, manned by an Air Force pilot who had already spent six months flying jets and bombers and things, and then his last six months over there, they put him in these little fat planes and they'd fly around over the jungle. They didn't have any armament, but they'd look around for targets for us to shoot. Well, I heard him call our, our tactical control center and say, he said, we have two ocean-going sampans that's stuck on a bar in the T-10 area, which was an area owned by the Hidden. And he said, we've got all kinds of people trying to get them off the off the sandbar, send somebody quick. And that, and of course, having received that kind of a message in the tactical control center, they cleared us the fire uh, before we even got there. And so this, we, we got there and uh, we could see the two sandpans with people milling all around. And so the pilot that was in charge, uh, Dick Stanger, decided to go down, and his, that was his routine all the time, to go down a little level, the target, to see if he could draw any fire from any place and to look and see what they had down there to, that we had to be aware of. So he went down and made a low sweep over the ship, and I mean low, you know, you go about five feet over the ship. And as I went down there, I saw about four adults, men and women, and about 12 or 14 children. It's from three, to, three years old up to about 14 or 15 years old. And, that, and I, I, we didn't have time, you know, we're working pretty fast here. I flew over and I waved to the kids and the waves, the kids waved back to me. We went out right over the target and Dick, my, my the lead pilot, made a big 180, come right in for six rockets right in the middle of both set pads. And I went, my gosh, what, what's this guy doing? I didn't see any reason to do that. Well, you don't have time to work on that too much when, and in those days, you know, I was a lieutenant commander at the time. I'd been in the Navy about 12 years. I was learning to do my job. My job was to, to give the lead ship protection. When the, way, the way we worked with two helicopters was the, the first helicopter would come in really close and fire, and then he would peel off, and when he peeled off, he didn't have any weapons on the target. So you came in then and kept their heads down while he got out of the way and came back around for another, and that was the tactics we always used. So I, I didn't have the guts to pull the trigger on the, the rockets I had, but. My, my gunners on both sides and the co-pilot were firing down there too. And so as I got close to the, the two ships, I looked over and here come this great big guy, when I say great big guy, it was a big heavy set guy running from the jungle. He was about 40 yards or so away from the two pans. He was wa waving his arms like this real uh, close together, frantically, I'm sure, indicating don't fire. And of course, as soon as our gunners saw him, they all just put their, you know, their weapons right on him. And the, the water was just white with bullets. And the guy went down. <clears throat> so we went down, we made a pass, we come around again for the second time. And as I came down again, here was this guy up again. He was running, waving frantically, you know, same thing, all the guns were on him, bullet was the, the water white with bullets, all these guys shooting at him. He went down a second time. So we went around for the third time and I came up and you can't believe the same guy was up. This time he looked bloody. But he was up still waving his hands. And my co-pilot was a Jewish boy from Brooklyn, New York, named Pete Shea. And Pete said to me, Norm, he said, I don't like this. This guy must be Buddha. And I, I thought, I'll never forget that. <laughs> but again, the guns were on him, everybody fired. He went down and he never got up again. But we made the three passes over the two ships. It was, they were on fire. I didn't see anybody alive but, except about a 14-year-old girl who was still running around the sandpans. We'd come in one direction, she'd run around the other direction and hide behind the sandpans and we'd come back again. And, but it only lasted 
short time when one of the gunners got her, so we killed them all. So here, I, I, as a, on the way back to my base, I thought, here is a poor guy, had his whole family gone to Saigon to Sal's Wood. And uh, sure, he, he made a mistake by going through this enemy, taking a shortcut through this enemy territory. He could have gone down to the Long Tower River and gone up, and nobody would have bothered him. But probably his ancestors for a thousand years had been selling wood in Saigon, taking that route. And nobody, the rules over there were so funky, nobody, the Vietnamese were the last people to get the rules. We knew the rules, but they didn't. So that's the way I looked at it. I, when we got back to the base, I, I got a hold of Dick and I said, Dick, I didn't see any reason to fire on those, uh, on those people. I, 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 I don't, he said, well, have you read, read what they say? They say they put these, all that wood on top of their boats and then make you think they're hauling wood and inside they're hauling machine guns and ammunition for the enemy. And he said, when, when they cleared us to fire, my orders was to fire. They, my orders wasn't that, that, well, I don't think I want to fire at these guys. My job is to, to destroy the target. And of course, I'd only been there two or three weeks, so I, but it didn't set with me. And for the whole year after that, every time I flew over that area, I looked down and the Pasantans were still there. And that brought back that ugly killing that poor guy, his family, and, and killing that poor guy and his family. So uh, I, that was my introduction into the war. Uh, most of my other stories are a lot more uh, uh, pleasant. Uh, I think I think the next one was an interesting one. It was about two or three uh, weeks later, and this time I was the fire team leader. Can you hear me back there? Hold up your head every time I drop my mic, my mic and I remember to put it over my mic, my mouth. So we were out flying on the sunny again, looking for a target, and we heard this uh, our tactical air control center say there was a ship. Uh, coming down the, the channel that was being attacked by about 50 of the enemy combatants. There was about, we never saw 50 fire on anything, but they, they had uh, rockets, mortars, and heavy machine guns firing on this ship. And uh, they asked if we'd come and help. We were about five minutes away from this target. So we, we came over and there they were standing out in the open firing. I couldn't believe it. That most of the time they run and hide when they hear us coming. But this time they were standing there firing on a ship. So we made two or three, four passes over firing machine guns and rockets at these, these guys. And finally they broke off and started, uh, started uh, uh, going back towards the jungle, which was, uh, which was about 30, 40 yards behind where they were. But I saw something that I, I never thought I'd see. As we, we were down at, uh, at uh, uh, well, about 100 feet flying into these, these people. And uh, the soldiers were, were everywhere there. And I could see the bullets come out the back of the soldiers. I said, I don't believe this. How could, I couldn't see them going in at all, but, but it seemed to me that I could see these projectiles going right through on the other side of the soldiers. And I thought, I never saw that in any movie I ever went to, but uh, when they killed people. So I went back and I was talking to, I went back and I was talking to our doctor. And he said, yes, you can see it, what happens, particularly with the 7.62, which is a very small projectile. When it goes through a human body, it hits bones and slows it down, picks up this bone fragment and picks up blood, and then when it goes, penetrates out the other side, it's, it has all this debris on the bullet. And if the backdrop is proper, you can see that come through the, the guy. And I said, wow, I never saw that in any, any movie I ever went to. But anyway, we ran out of ammunition, and so there's a destroyer that the, the Navy kept at the southern end of the, this river, the Long Tau River, and for artillery work. So we called this destroyer and said, we, we've got this target, uh, would, they, would they come and fire on it? So they said they would, and ask us to spot for them. When you spot for them, they fire uh, one shot, and you tell them, is that long, short, or, or good? And so usually you say, no, that's short. It's another 100 yards or long. And finally say, okay, that's good. And then they go to town, they put everything they got and, and put it in that area. <clears throat> so the next day, the Vietnamese sent a company of people in to see what happened. They found out there was 48 dead. Uh, the, there were no wounded that night. They, they take their own wounded out, but there were no wounded. 
But it was interesting, there was a small ship, they a little small boat that was on uh, the shoreline loaded with explosives. So what they surmised to be what they were going to do was try to, de uh, to uh, uh, damage that ship so much that it couldn't move. And then at night, they were going to go up and take that, that boat up next to the, next to the big ship and, and explode it and sink that ship in the channel. And this was a bend in the channel, and no ships could have come up that if they could have do that. So this was their best effort, uh, we thought, but it failed. And the year I was there, uh, there were many, many ships shot at, but never any that was ever sunk in that, in the Long Tao River, which went up to, from the South China Sea to Saigon. I, I, there is one other story that bothers me a lot, and I'll try to get that out of the way really quickly with that. About a week or two later, my fire team, and my wingman and I were firing on a target. Uh, two or three guys were fired on a ship. This was usually the case. And they, we'd ask them where it was, and they'd say, well, it's coming from uh, 100, 100 yards into the jungle, about 270 degrees, and we'd fly over the ship, go out 270 degrees, fire everything we had in the jungle there, then go back home and reload again. Well, we, we started home again. They said, no, they're firing again. And we said, well, where, where is it coming from? And this time they said, be real accurate for us. And the guy said, okay. He said, it's coming about 200 degrees, about 50 yards in the jungle. I said, okay, we went over there and didn't see anything again. So we kept getting lower and lower. And there's a thing they told us that one of the 10 reasons that are one of the 10 things that Hilo pilots should do if they want to stay alive in Vietnam was to spend as little time as possible between the deck, uh, five or six feet off the deck, and 1,000 feet. So anytime you're in this, this deck under 1,000 feet, they, they can get you. So we were down about 100 feet. Look, and you can't see anything up at 1,000 feet, to be honest. You got to get down low. So it's a catch-22. But we were down about 100 feet, and looking, and all of a sudden, uh, I, I felt like the plane was going in a thunderstorm and the crew started saying, hey, we're taking fire, we're taking fire. So I, I, I looked down and, and, and leveled out what, what we're doing and the RPM went down from, it's normal at six, the RPM to, to fly the helicopters, normally at 6,600 RPM. And this went down about 4,500 RPM, so I thought we're losing the engine. So I prepared the auto rotate, which was uh, the only thing you can do, uh, you may not know this, but the time you lose an engine as a helicopter pilot to the time you can get that collecting down and take the load off the engine, the propellers will stop, the, the road will, will stop. Now you're like a rock falling. So you have about a tenth of a second to a second to get the, the collecting down. So the most helicopter pilots have this. Anything goes wrong, they pop the collecting down, even though they should. But it's just automatic. So I popped the, the collecting down. I looked, the RPM went back up to 6,600 RPM. And, and the, the plane, as always, flew back to our base. We got back to our base. We found out that a bullet had gone through the bell mount of the, of the engine. The bell mount is a plastic thing that directs the air into the engine right in the front. A bullet had gone through there and, and splintered it, and it shattered, and the engine ate it. And uh, these propeller blades in the engine have gone around thousands of RPM, I don't know. But it just ate it up. Usually, it'll stop the engine. But for some reason, this engine ate it up, chewed it up, swallowed it, and went back to normal at 6,600 RPM. I always, you know, the, <laughs> you, you go home and thank God that, that you're still alive. But we, uh, I, what this had to do was with my co pilot And it was the biggest mistake I ever made. Vietnam, at least, was I called our maintenance officer. I got back to him what happened, and I asked him if uh, if he would was what I should do. And he said, "Well, we're going to have to change that engine." He said, uh, "I said, what are you going to hook it back?" To, we were at uh, Nabe, and our, our maintenance unit was at a place called Bung Tao, which was on the South China Sea, a big base down there. We did all the maintenance work on the Hueys. He said, uh, "Well, what do you think?" And I said, "Well, it was working fine when we came home." I, let me go out and check it out again. So I went out and started it, took it out and flew around the field again. Seemed fine. And I called her back and I said, well, it looks like it's working fine to me. It ought to 
at least if I could get the plane back that day, I could get a new one back again, and we'd have we'd get back on the line to, to do our, our mission. With one, we never fly one in Vietnam. He never flew by herself. He always had a wing. So I, he said, "Okay, we'll fly it back down." There's a flying co-pilot, Dave Gallahan. If if uh, he's the one, he's the one on the right. Nice kid, right out of flight school. Uh, he's from Atlanta, Georgia. His wife was pregnant. I saw Dave, I said, Dave, would you like to fly that plane back down to, to uh, downtown? Because he wouldn't be with me, he'd be by himself. They love flying by themselves anyway. He said, sure, I'd love to. I said, we'll get your co-pilot and a couple of gunners, go down there and fly it, let them change the engine, wait for it. When you get it back, fly it back. And this evening we'll be ready to go at night when we, when we need it. So he took off and got about halfway down to downtown. It was about a 30-minute, 40-minute flight. <coughs> Uh, and the engine uh, flamed out, and he had to auto rotate into the. Into the we always, Navy people always auto rotate in the water. We don't like auto rotating in the jungles. We were told if they caught us as helicopter pilots, they barbecued you and kind of skins you alive. So that thought said, if ever we have to go down, we're going to go down in the water. And so anyway, he auto rotated in, into the water, did a good job from what I was told. And uh, uh, these helicopters sink like a rock, uh, and they're not ships, and just sunk quickly. And, and the other three people got out, and they told me that they thought they saw him out of the aircraft, but when they got to shore, they swam to shore, he wasn't there. <coughs> and uh, he, uh, the PBRs came in and looked for him for the rest of the day until dark, couldn't find his body or alive or dead. So we, uh, we knew he was gone. But about two or three days later, they found his body. It was a few miles downstream. Brought it back to our base. And, and the doctor called me on the phone and said, how about coming over and identifying the body? And I said, Doc, I can't do that. I said, I love that kid. I said, uh, and I just don't think I can do it. I'll, I'll remember it the rest of my life if I have to remember him looking like you can imagine what a body four days on the bottom of a river looks like. Uh, uh, it's, it's not a pretty sight. So he said, well, you've got to come over and find somebody else to do it. So I hate to admit that I found somebody else to do it. I found one of those young guys and asked him, who was a good friend of his? And, and I, I, I kind of bribed him. I, I, he said, no, I don't want to do it. I said, well, if, if you go identify the body, I'll send you back as an escort with the body to his home in Atlanta, Georgia, and then you can go see your wife, who lived in Memphis, Tennessee. I said, you can spend three or four days with your wife. He said, okay, I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> so he did it. And, uh, and I, uh, I, obviously it was my fault in judgment. No, uh, today it's just not worth it. You, for two reasons, why are you going to destroy here we lost the, the plane, it cost, I don't know, several hundred thousand dollars, and a man's body, because I decided to fly it down rather than, <clears throat> I decided to have it flown down rather than have it hooked down. We could hook them down, they had these flying cranes that, uh, that would just pick these planes up like that, take them all the way down in the air, drop them down there, because then they're not, uh, you know, that takes some time to arrange that, probably take five or six hours to get it there. So I thought, the, since it's working good, but it was a poor decision. <clears throat> this, this next story has to do with the Tet Offensive. Have any of you ever remembered or heard about the Tet Offensive in Vietnam? I'm sure if you were, if you were had anything to do with it, why well, it was a, an interesting event. The, v, the, the Viet Cong was, was the enemy there in, uh, in South Vietnam had probably at least 100,000 troops or people, maybe more than that. And we had close to a million over there, I think, right? counting the, 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 the Vietnam soldiers. But we had, but they could always mass their people together and go overrun something. This was their plan, just get a thousand of us together and we'll overrun those 20 people that's guarding that village. So they always did that, but in Tennis, uh, New Year's Eve, on 1967, all these 100,000 or 120,000 troops came out 
and overran almost every major city in Vietnam, and, and, and including Saigon. And uh, it was an interesting event. And uh, I had the duty that night, and they called me on the phone and said, uh, uh, Commander, we, we need your help. Uh, somebody called me from Saigon, I forget who it was, but uh, from the security agency up there and said, uh, the, the enemy is coming, overran all our stations, it's blown up our hel helicopters. Can you come up here and give us a hand? And I said, it's about 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock at night. And I said, no, I said, I can't go. I said, I don't know that area up there. I said, I don't know where anything is. I don't know where the bad guys are, the good guys. I don't know where the things to watch out for. If you sent me in there on target, I wouldn't have a clue where it is. There's no lights up there, no directions. So here's how you get to, to, to this security post there. I wouldn't have a clue. So I said, sorry, I, I can't. Uh, my area is south of Saigon. I know that area. I, I just don't think I can help you. So I went back to playing poker or whatever I was doing. And uh, I got a call from my commanding officer. He said, Nice guy named Bob Spencer. He said, Norm, how about going up and giving those guys a hand up there in Saigon? He said, we don't know what's going on. Something strange is going on in, in, in Saigon. They're in trouble all over the country. Can you go up there and give them a hand? And they said, of course. It was a skipper, obviously. So we did. We took off a bunch of flares. We did great big flares. We put about six or eight of those in the cockpit there in the, in the in the two Hueys, went up there, and the only thing I saw when we were up there, we were the only fire team over Saigon all night long. I saw this Vietnamese A-34, which is an ancient helicopter flying around about 500 feet, and doing nothing, he didn't have any armor, and he was on the same frequency I was on, and I called him and said, are you in any trouble? Why you? He says, well, I can't land because they overran my base. He said, the BC is in charge of my base and I can't land. I said, well, you know where Nob Bay is? And he said, no. And I said, well, just go down the highway there until you come to the, the river, and that's a, there's the Navy base down there. Go ahead, go down there, and you can land. So he left, and I never saw him again. I hope he got there. So it was only me and my wingman all night over Saigon when I attacked. The first target they called us in was the guy was saying that, you know, things like, and they're inside our perimeter. I said, they just blew off my leg. You know, this stuff was going on. I said, if I had a recording, it would have been something you'd never see in a movie. It was that bad. And we got to, they said, we want to send you out to a, a place called BOQ number three, which is a large uh, hotel that they had purchased and put walls around it and security around it for people that were stationed there in Saigon. And they were being overran, they overran, the, and they couldn't see them, and they were getting ready to, to, to take control of that facility. So we had the flares, and we dropped the flares, and then as, as the, the flares lit, lit up the whole area, we dropped them at 1,300 feet. They were this around about five feet long, and threw them out by hand, and held on to the guard, and it ignited the flag, the, the flare, and also a little parachute that took it down. It took about 10 minutes to get the ground. And you could see just like daylight. And we looked over there, and they're all around this BLQ. You know, our, our thing was, we could never see them. They were always hiding and running. Here we could see them. We knew that they were in because there was nobody up that night at that time because of what was going on. So we had a feeling that we just kept going around the, the facility, shooting, every, shooting everything that moved. And eventually, there was nobody else to shoot at. And we asked and said, well, are you taking any fire? And they said, uh, no, we're fine. I said, well, Call us if anybody bothers you again, we'll be back and give you a hand. So then we, we got a, a call from the Marine people in the embassy. They had breached the walls in the embassy, as you can see. This is a, a picture of the, they blown a hole in it and gone inside the em, embassy grounds. The ambassador was there with an automatic machine gun. It was, and the Marines were inside there. But they didn't have any lights and they were having trouble. Uh, finding the targets and, and shooting. They had everything boarded up. They asked if we could start illuminating uh, their facility. So for the rest of the night, we dropped flares. I uh, said one my wingman would, would go up to 1,300 feet, drop the flare. And uh, like I say, it would last for 10 minutes. He had about five or six, so we could do it an hour when he was through. He would go back to the base, pick out more flares, uh, rearm, and regas up 
up and come back in the night and do that. We did that all until daylight in the morning, just dropping flares so we could. The interesting thing is that we could see the work these Marines do. They are really, really good. They're brave. They're skilled with what they've been trained to do. Uh, everything they did just impressed me, especially one thing the next morning. The next morning, they asked us to direct a, a resupply helicopter to the, to the embassy. This army body didn't know where the embassy was. He'd never been in Saigon. So we said, you know, we picked him up on the edge of town, brought him to the embassy. There was a, a helo pad on top of the embassy. And we drifted and he landed on the top of the embassy. And they unloaded whatever the gear. And the guy picked up the collective went out about 10, 10 yards and a machine gun across the street in the building, the four-story building on, on the main thing. You can't see the street here from the, uh, some of the other pictures that shows the, shows the street. Uh, here it is. See, here's the street on this side. And it's just a main drag that's uh, in Saigon. And it's just buildings, uh, apartment buildings, things like that on the other side. And so this machine gun was firing on this, this helicopter resupply helicopter, a slick. A slick is a helium without the guns. And uh, in front of the slick, and you got about 50 feet in the middle of the plane was pulled from Christ down there to about uh, down the side of the parking lot there. <clears throat> but what, what impressed me is when that gun started firing out of that building, there were three screams of tracers going up into that window from rings on the ground in the ground there firing into that window. And the whole window just kind of exploded. The, the obviously no one was was alive. So I sent my I sent my uh, windshield over to where this plane crashed to see how, how badly they were, were doing. And he said they were all outside of the airplane, so they were at least alive. And so I told him to pick up, to go there and pick up the, the, the survivors and take them wherever they want to go. So he went over and picked them up and took them somewhere to the base, wherever their base was. And I joined with two army helicopters to make a, a uh, army charlie models. To make, to make a heavy fire team. It's the only time I was over there that I was part of a heavy fire team. And so uh, uh, we, I got, the, the, and of course, this, the Army now was in charge, and I was the third guy. Uh, with, uh, and these, these Army helicopters are flown by these young board officers. They're 20, 21, 22 years old. Wild as March Hares. They would do things that maybe guys would never dream. You know, they, just to see if they told, told you not to do it, they would do it to show you it could be done. And they're really great to have in the war, but, but uh, uh, I know I saw one of them One thing they told us, number two on the list is how to stay alive as a helicopter pilot in Vietnam was never go down and pick up souvenirs. They were always going down. Whatever they did, they went down and got a souvenir for it. And, but it, it never tempted me. I never even thought about it. So anyway, I joined with these uh, two, and they sent us over to the first target was to go over. There was a heavy machine gun on top of the church. So it was a Catholic church. And I thought, I don't think we had any Catholics in, in Vietnam, but I guess we did. So uh, but it looked like a Catholic church to me, and they were up in the bell tower. And it was open up the top there, and here was this heavy machine gun firing down on this 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 camp that was over about 50 yards away, 50 yards away. And so these, these two, two army guys, they, they went ahead of me. I was the third guy. They went right up to the target, put a nice few rockets right inside the windows. So we we'll turn out both those guys did that. I did that, or those two guys did that, and it was my turn. I went and I fired one rocket, and it hit in there, and the whole side of that thing fell over. The valves the came out, the whole thing just crumbled over the right. And I thought, guys, I didn't think I was that good. <laughs> but it was these army guys that just destroyed it before I got there. So then the, the next thing they did was send us to a target and was on the entrance to Thompson and Air Base. There was a, a, another, another heavy weapon in a window. It was firing on an electrical relay station, a big electrical that provided the electri electricity for that whole base. And so I said, come over and see, take this gun out. And so I knew where this was because it was the emphasis 
I probably won't get to it, but I played a lot of golf while I was in Vietnam, and that's where the golf course was. So anyway, we, we flew over there, and we went and found a window in the street on there, and we see lots of smoke coming out of there. And the same thing, and the amazing thing was to me was to see these taxi cab drivers and people on their bicycles going up and down the streets, and because this was different now. This was tech. But before that, that never happened for years, you know. Saigon was safe. And so people, and they'd been at war for 10 years. So the people were kind of new to, to, uh, to the war. And, uh, uh, yeah, excuse me, I'm looking at the time. But, uh, so, uh, we, uh, I was just amazed. I thought, well, since it's New Year's Day, Probably the kids aren't in school because it was a school building uh, uh, that was down in the, the middle of the floor of this building. So these army guys went up right to the iron wall again, and I got almost up in it, fired their rockets, and pulled straight up like that, until they and peeled off like, like they were doing some acrobatic trick. The next guy came in and did the same thing. You know, it was on the side of the building, but for me, when that pulled up, and then I said, I am not about to do that in hundred years. So I came in, I was way away from the building, and I fired my first rocket. And I ran over the building, over, and hit this rain shower on the golf course. And I thought, oh my gosh, I destroyed my golf course. <laughs> so I, I pushed, pushed the, the nose over a little bit, fired another rocket. And this one went into one of the windows down below. And I said, oh gosh, I hope the kids aren't in school today. And so then I got a little closer, and I managed to hit the target. So, so after that, my, uh, the army guys chewed up that target. I'd been out 12 hours straight without the, any rest fire. On. You've got a lot of extra energy when things like that's going on. I didn't realize I was tired. I didn't realize how tired I was. And so I told the guys, I said, hey, fellas, I'm going to have to go home. I'm an old guy, and i got to go get some rest. And they said, OK, thanks, buddy. Adios. And so I left and went back. But what was interesting about this whole thing was that the Vietnamese finally were able to get these people out of the city. But one of the areas of the city called Cholan was a Chinese area that uh, was built, uh, and, and D.C. went into this Chinese area because they felt they were treated better, I guess, and because the Chinese didn't like the Vietnamese, uh, the people who were in the government either. So they went in there, and this area was about the size of Encinitas, I think it was a big area. And the Vietnamese decided to burn it. So it had a big wall around it, so they fired in incendiaries and burned down the whole area. And as the people came out, if they were Chinese, they let them go. If they were Vietnamese, they sent them to the enemy and they executed them. But for about a month, I could, I could see it from our base. And for about a month, I looked over there and I said, China's children are still burning. And they burned it to pieces. You can see a big city the size of Massachusetts just burned it to the to the ground. <clears throat> I, I I hope so because I'm going to go to my the, the, the story I I really enjoy the best. It was the best experience for me. I think that that uh, you know I, I as I get older as I get older I've learned that rarely in your life if ever. You get the opportunity to put your life on the loan solely for the life of another person. And again, I'm not a great person. In fact, I didn't think I ran into too many great people in Vietnam. We were all just kind of fatalistic. The first couple, three weeks, we thought everybody was trying to kill us. Then after that, we thought, well, we'll go crazy if we think like that. So we think, well, we're just going to do our thing. So everybody was just happy to like running on as if they were in their backyards. But when they when they were given a mission to do that was dangerous, we did it. And I don't think there were any heroes over there, but during this occasion was, was one which uh, changed my whole life. Uh, I came back from playing golf. I joined the golf course over there, by the way. Cost a hundred bucks. Wish I had a picture of that. You'll see it over here. You'll never see that again in your life. Is somebody having a, 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 a uh, a, a golf card which says a membership card, the golf club de Saiga. I got one. I didn't stop it. But anyway, I came back and, uh, and uh, I took over the duty at 4 o'clock in the afternoon. 
We usually go out for an hour or so looking for targets. We, uh, you know, it was a place where you could do anything, that, everything that you couldn't do in the United States. So what we love to do is eagle pilots. We like to love that one. Does anybody in a pilot that knows what the low leveling is, it's going to go down as low off the ground as you can possibly get. Now, if you get down to 18 inches, you can go down to 18 inches. And you just kind of know the weeds and the trees and the stuff and fly around. We did that for about 20 minutes on every flight until people were breaking the windshields so much in the, uh, by doing this that the commanding officer said, the next guy that breaks the windshield is going to have to pay for it himself. And they ran about a thousand bucks. So people were not doing it as much. But so anyway, we, we went out and I came back and usually we, our, our, uh, the Navy people worked at night. The Army people worked during the day. But so most of our action was at night. And so we, we'd sit around all night long waiting for people to call us in, we give them the hand, pick up the seals, deliver them. Uh, help the uh, people be you known or whatever. But we were sitting there playing poker, which we did almost every night in between flights. <clears throat> and all of a sudden, there's three or four big bangs there. And uh, I've never seen, been on a base that had been under attack. Neither had any of these guys. But I looked at these seven guys who were playing poker, and their eyes would start terror. Like, <laughs> we all knew what was happening. The base was being attacked. So. The, 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 uh, so we were at the second deck of a very large Quonset hut, and the, and the bunker, uh, a sand bunker, a real nice, sophisticated, large bunker, was sitting over here on the side. So everybody jumped up, except me. I was winning. Hello? <laughs> Hello? Yeah. Okay. I was winning, and I got about 500 bucks on the side here. And it's like, I got to 500 bucks, and my billfold was there, and my 45 caliber pistol was there, and my flight suit was half down. It was, I took it off my arms because it was so hot. So you can imagine I'm waddling down the last guy, waddling down the passageway to get to the ladder that goes downstairs to get to the bunker. And there was this young guy ahead of me. And rather than going down the stairs that went in towards where the rockets were, the bunker was over here, and he just reached up the top, hurled over the top of those stairs, jumped down there, it was about 10 feet, but you know, sent me down there. I said, boy, what a great idea. <laughs> by then I by then I had my flight suit up, so I put my two hands on there, I threw, oh, I threw my pistol and my billful, because I had it in the other hand. Threw my pistol and my billful down there, put my two hands on, hurled over there, caught my leg, on the side, and now yeah, I can remember thinking, I can't believe this is me falling head first off of this ladder. And boy, I, I hit and I, I, I really hurt. I, 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 was, I was hurt so badly I didn't move. I just, I, I just sat there. And, and, uh, and I, then I looked over and a couple more rockets dropped in it near me. And I think I better get out of here. So I crawled as, like a baby as fast as I could over to the entranceway of the bunker. And I just laid there in the entrance way and I got there. And I looked out and I saw these two pilots coming across the, the way, they, arm in arm with bottles of booze of some sort in each hand there, singing songs, making fun of the people that were running that were the, the, to the bunker. And it was the guy I had relieved at 4 o'clock in the afternoon, this, this Dick Stanger. And so he came and he tripped over me. I was still laying on the floor there. He tripped over me and he got his flesh on it and he said, Norm, is that you down there? And I said, yeah, Dick, I said, I, I just fell off the top ladder of that building over there and broke every bone in my body. I said, would you take my flight for me? He said, guys, Norm, I can't. He said, I've been drinking since 4 o'clock in the morning, 4 o'clock in the afternoon when you were leaving. He said, I'm just joking with skunk. And he put his light in my face and he says, I think you're all right. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, help me up, then, Dick, see if I can stand up. <laughs> so he helped me up. And I could stand up and I looked out. And I know, first, first I looked back and I saw the two pilots, the four, two gunners of the wing ship. That was my wing ship. And that's where I wanted to be back there. I looked up and I saw my helicopter turning. And I thought, this dumb pilot, my co-pilot is out there. He's got it all turned up. The two gunners are like this staring at 
He said, where is North Elder? You know, and I thought, I thought for just a minute, I said, but the only thing I thought, I know if, if I were him, I would take off, and quickly, and he's going to kill himself. He's a young pilot, he, he'll kill himself, and I can't live with that, so I'm not a brave man, but didn't see my, any option I had. I had to go out there. So I ran out there, I ran out there and about halfway out there in a rocket hit a bunch of fuel, but empty fuel barrels. Kicked them over my one and rolled over me. I didn't even feel it. I was so scared. I <laughs> think. <laughs> but I finally got to the plane and my helmet and my flag vest and my uh, my uh, May West and the chicken plate. We had a chicken plate. We had it was just solid solid steel that like it could conform to your chest. You rest it on your legs and you put it inside your 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 flag vest. And so you had the flag vest, the chicken plate, you put the you put the 45 pistol between your legs to protect the kind of the jewels so that it's running. So you put the 45 between your legs there, and so I, it was all sitting on my seat. I grabbed the helmet and sit on I mean, I sit there on the top, and I said, I said, get the hell out of here. And he's a big, strong guy. He looked like a halfback from the Chicago Bears. And he went, like, like this, and the plane just swirls around. The door could have done that. Pull it around instead of facing into the wind like a ship. Now it's facing downwind. And no lights this way, and the lights of the side on at least was up in that direction. So now he's going, uh, he's about 18 inches off the ground. The RP the RPM on the when he jumped it flatly up like this. The RPM went from 66 of them out to under 5,000, because you know it's under 5,000. Because the red light is big red light about this big is flashing in your eyes. And I, I thought, this at first I thought, this guy is going to kill me. I'm gonna die. And the only thing I could think to do, I tried to I he couldn't hear me. So I tried to push down on the collecting because if you just push it down a little bit, it would take the load off of it and the RPM would jump back up. But he couldn't let go of it. And I couldn't overpower. And I said he's gonna kill me. So the only thing I could think of doing Calling every name I could think of. And I grew up on the streets, and I knew all the dirty names. <laughs> it took me about five minutes to explain every dirty name I could think of. And, and the plane was keep creeping towards the water. Finally, he got to the edge of the, he finally got to the edge of the runway and creeped out over the water. And I said, so I got out of the seat. I'm sitting on top of this. I got out of the seat and got my knee. Finally wedged my knee between the collective and the back of the thing. Pushed it down just enough, and the RPM went like that, and the plane went up in the air. And, uh, and we, got, we got away with that. And I, could, I told Dick, I said, I think we're over the water now. He said, No, we're not. And I said, I can smell the fish. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, we got into the water, we got in the air, and I put on all my big rice and chicken plate and my helmet. Now we're talking. And I said, Nick, turn off the lights, we're by ourselves. So we don't want them to see us. So he turned off the lights for the helicopter. We looked down and we could see, we could see the, the rockets coming from about six or eight, uh, six or eight places, different places. So we just made some conservative runs, single plane runs over, and there were six of them. We just took on one at a time. The Vietnamese were pretty good. We may not have got them, but we scared them. We could make enough noise around them that scared them, and they like any human being to go around and hide. So but either we, we scared them, but eventually, about 30 minutes, we got them all out. And I, was, I was looking around, I was looking around, and the first two were back on again, fire way right down on the other side. I said, and I heard this guy say, hey, Norm, where are you? And I said, I said, sounds like Dick Steiner, this drunk that wouldn't go fly for me. I said, is that you, Dick? And he said, yeah, that's me. And I said, well, I'm down here by the fuel floor. He said, turn on your lights, I'll come and give you a hand. I said, okay, fine, I need some help, I'm about out of ammo. So he came with me and we flew and put these other fires out there. <clears throat> and then, then the Puff the Magic Dragon Dragon ride. Does anybody know uh, who Puff the Magic Dragon was? <laughs> this was? This was a great, great thing they had in Vietnam. They had the C-47, uh, the old Second World War C-47, and they put this Batman game gun in there, and I don't sort of know what the caliber was, but they had a, a field level uh, light. Uh, light vision attached 
for two, so they can have a text and you know, you look at it, it's like they don't need to find anything that's moving, just set up there 1,500 feet and fire at will, you know, and it's really powerful, so it's all right. Not good at it, so I went back to the, I went back and said, I'm land, we landed, and I went out to tell Dick thanks that, for coming out there and helping me. I looked, he didn't have a crew pilot or no gunners. He was up there by himself. And well, I, I thought that's really strange, you know, because he was putting out a lot of fire. I was trying to picture how he was doing it. Yeah. But the, the, the grip on one side, flying with his feet or something, but. Yeah, you know, he kind of put, uh, he put one of the drum gun and was firing a pistol gun for the, for the machine guns. Or this side was firing a rocket and, and flying his, uh, the airplane with his feet, I guess. But, but he was doing a heck of a job putting out a lot of fire, and I really appreciate it. So I didn't think, I didn't think he was going to be I said, I'm really happy to be back alive. And so we went over to the, uh, to the mess hall to get, it was, the, the, the lights were on in the base, but there was lights over there, little dim lights on them every week. So I'm going to get some breakfast about 2 o'clock in the morning. So I went in there and got me something. And the flight surgeon was there, who's a our flight surgeon for our squadron, was based there. And he was sitting beside me. We were just talking, and the lights came right on for, that, for the scene. He looked over at my face and he said, "He said, Norm, what did you do to your face?" I said, "What do you mean?" He said, "There's dried blood all over your face and all over you. There's dried blood all over your face and all, and all over your, your uniform." And I said, "Not my face. <laughs> I said, my chest. I don't mind. <laughs> Not my face." I was kidding I thought. Anyway, he said the jaw was hanging loose here or something. He said, come over to my office. He said, I'll fix you up. So, so he went out and has my luck, but I've always had good luck. I found out he was, in, in his, his education, he was a, a plastic surgeon. In <laughs> so he said, don't worry about it. He said, I'll, I'll stitch it up in the natural creases. I'll stitch you up in the natural creases of your face. He said, you got one down there and I can pull your chin back up on that one, this one I can put down there. And except for one, I, I got one scar left over here, otherwise I can't even find it. But what I learned that night was, was interesting, was that when a base is, is under attack like that, everybody that he treats gets a Purple Heart. I don't know. You, you could be a, a window washer, a, a dishwasher, and trip over the, the, the the threshold of the door, break your toe, go over there and get treated, you get a purple heart. Everybody he treats. Which is easier to do it that way than let him come to him and say, I got one last night or something. So they do that. So about the downside of that was my wife could tell you the story was was that they sent her a letter or a, a, a Western Union telegram and said that your husband has been wounded in battle in, in your husband's been wounded in battle in Vietnam. He's been treated and returned to duty. And she got this by mail. You know, they, it was a, she opened it up and she, for about, she told me she told, was afraid to open it up for about three hours because she knew that it was and I told her, I said if I'd been killed, the chaplain would have come with the letter. So when you only got the letter you know, it's all right. So anyway about three days later and I've got to finish this story I will I hope it is. But about uh, three weeks later, here I got a, a, a purple heart. And I went, my gosh, that's all right. <laughs> so uh, what had happened, uh, about three days after that, the seal of the squadron came to my, my base. I, he said that we, the base had been under attack. He wanted to look and see the damage and stuff. So he was there for about an hour. And he said to me, let's go to the bar. I went over to the bar with him. And he said, what is this I hear about your whole detachment being drunk the other night during the attack? And I said, Skipper, I don't even drink. He said, that's not the truth. I said, let me tell you what happened. So I told him what happened and about Dick Stanger and, uh, and everything that went on that night. And he said, well, Norm, he said, he said I believe what you're, you're saying. He said, I'm going to write you up for a silver star, and I want you to write up Dick Stanger for a distinguished flying cross. I said, okay. So I wrote up this thing there. I had to kind of hide in there and the fact that he was drinking. So I sent this in, and lo and behold, he was awarded a distinguished flying cross. And I am convinced that this is the only time in the history of 
of legal aviation where a pilot has been awarded the distinguished flying cross by a flying drunk. It's <laughs> <laughs> better be true. Oh yes. I, uh, those are, uh, I, I, all I think I'd better get to the, today is almost new, but I, I would be happy to answer any questions you might have uh, uh, at all. Uh, yes. yes. I had uh, two questions. Uh, was uh, Huey before the Cobra? Or? No, it was before. Was the, uh, yeah, the Cobra came in and had two inches, which uh, I like. I, I enjoy five points. It got an extra inch, but it came. Excuse me. It came in later. And the second thing is, I understand the helicopter pilots have the lowest life expectancy of all flights out there. And how were you able to survive or people with those many combat missions? Well, I, I don't know either. You know, I never thought about it. I was, I, I was doing this uh, this thing about Dave Callahan, my pilot. That was kind of the exception that it wasn't in a combat flight. That was just a ferry flight. And so I said that was an exception to the rule. But uh, they were killed down the we didn't get any pilots in the, in the squadron when I was there, the year I was there. And while I was there, 12 of them were killed. But, but in all honesty, the area I had was the easiest, I think, because we had a lot of help. Uh, and where they were down south in the, in the Delta, the, the VC were stronger, and, and uh, they had to do harder things to protect their, their people. And they just, uh, uh, 12 of them got killed. Stories that come up, he'll probably tell more. <laughs> Thank you very much.